Hello, it's Denise. This is podcast number two with our dear friend, Sandra Guterres. So hello, Ms. Sandra. Welcome back. Thank you for having me again, Denise. It's a gift to me to see you today. This is, you know, I do these podcasts, Sandra, for two or three reasons. One, I wanted to still work with Cindy. And two, and especially during the pandemic, it gave me a sense still that there was community. Do you know what I mean? Because the pandemic was hard on everyone, certainly. But I used to get out more. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) Now, madam, the reason I wanted you to come back, because we really just touched on your writing career, on your first book, The Southern Latino Table. But I know that you have an an exciting news that one of your books is being re-released. So can you tell us about that? I am so happy. My second cookbook, Latin American Street Food, is a bestseller. So they have re-released it in paperback, which is amazing with full color photos. It's just beautiful. I I just got my copy on the mail and I could not believe it. It's so pretty. I cooked out of that book when it first came out, Sandra. It's a fabulous book. I am not surprised. And if you... So if people don't know what a re-release is, it's exactly what it says. It means that the publisher decided that they could make money again by promoting this book. Now, people don't all know book sales. Sandra, we know it because we've been authors. I have written books that have sold more than I ever thought possible. And I have written one or two books that we would, I would definitely think you would call it a stinker. Okay. <laughs> they were- they were good books. They didn't sell. Okay. Now, some of them, it's amazing. They're still in print, but it's because the publisher hasn't killed it yet. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't know if people realize that sometimes you can write a really good book and it can sell a lot and the publisher still will just kill it. Okay. Yeah. And it disappears into the annuals of time. How exciting for you. So it wasn't your idea. They contacted you and said, we're going to re-release this book. That's right. It was really oh. exciting. And then two months later, I've got the book in my hand. So they were thinking about it before they told me. Sure. You know what? I think again, you may have been, you were before the curve with that book. I remember the book and I cooked out of it. It was a fabulous book. So again, you were, you know, and this is kind of when life catches up with your ideas. Do you know what I mean? If that's an amazement. And that's exactly how the book came out, that book, because I was at an IACP conference in Portland. Oh, I remember Portland. I remember Portland? Yeah. And, and we went, a few of us escaped, escaped <laughs> at the lunch hour, you know, and we decided to go see all the food trucks because Portland, of course, had this huge park of food trucks. There were like, I don't know, 300, 400 food trucks. And so we each went with a plan. We said, we each will go and get 10 different things. There were like 20 of us. And so we all went different places and then got together in this giant table and put all the food there. And as we were eating, we realized that we had only found one Latin American dish, one taco. That was the only thing that we had found. There was Polish, there was German, there was Russian, there was Thai, there was of all the different countries, but only one Latin American from Mexico. And so I remember going back from lunch and going to see my agent who was sitting at the audience at the next conference. And I said, I know what I want to write about next. And she said, what? And I told her and she said, go for it. Let's do it. And three months later, the book was sold. Brilliant. And look at where tacos have come now. Yeah. To the okay. White House. <laughs> An explosion. An explosion. That's so funny. That's really, see, I, you, you have to look beyond today. And I know that's not easy for people. I say that all the time to people. You kind of, I always called it my five-year plan. Where did I want to see myself in five years? I knew I was busy doing what I was doing, but what did I want to see? Where did I want that to go in five years? Do you know what I mean? Did I want to keep writing books? Did I want to, you know, did I want, at some point, you know, you I think to stay fresh, you have to change up what you're doing. That's just me. Do you know what I mean? It's like, but also industry changes. For me, I just realized one day that I wasn't going to style anymore. Do you know what I mean? I love it still, Sandra, but the industry changed. Do you know what I mean? 
it changes and publishing has changed. So, oh but my publishing has changed a lot in the past 10 years. What have you seen? Tell us that. Well, ever since Gourmet Magazine crashed. Crashed. It crashed. The first thing that it did is it democratized writing. Yes. All of a sudden, it didn't matter if you were a writer or a cookbook author that had, you know, 40 <laughs> years of experience. All of a sudden, there were people who had blogs who became, you know, authors and anybody could write about food all of a sudden. So it was that democratization, if you will, of food. But I also uh, like the point that you make about looking ahead, especially with cookbooks, because what people don't understand is that you will sign a contract for a cookbook one year and the book sometimes takes two, three, four, five years to come out. And if that subject matter that you thought of was just a fad in five years or three years later, it, it's no longer appealing and no longer saleable, you know? That's right. Honey, I know I don't want you to give it away, but you've mentioned two or three times now that your next book, you keep calling it a big book. Tell us why you say that. It was well, asking anything away you're not supposed to. So it's a big book, meaning it's going to be a large compendium of recipes. And wow. the exciting thing for me is that this book is being published in two separate editions, one entirely in English, one entirely in Spanish. Oh. It's being published by Kanaf Random House. So I couldn't get any luckier, you know, with, no. with who, who bought the book. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this book that I think is going to change a lot of ideas of what Latin American cooking really is. Senator, that congratulations. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, you know, I don't, you've mentioned this and you mentioned it in the last time. There are 21 countries that make up Central and Southern Latin America, Latin America itself. 21 countries. I was lucky enough because when I worked for Holland America, I went to South America, not once, but twice. Do you know what I mean? And Central America at the same time, you know, East. We would start in Miami, go, you know, hit the high points, um, go through the Panama Canal and then do South America. But I've been to Central America several times because I love it because I love the food in Guatemala and Honduras, I can, re I can remember it till today. And we were in Guatemala and we drove all the way to a uh, border. Yeah. And we were with a cab driver and I kept saying to Kenny, is this, are we supposed to be going into another country? Do you know what I mean? When we were in one and we have, uh, we, uh, we got off the ship and we're on the passports. But the bottom line is, we got to this gorgeous little restaurant and the woman was Guatemalan and her husband was Honduran. So they kind of had their foot in both places. It was one of the most memorable meals I've ever had in my life. So then when I got to go to South, South America and I was in Peru and in Chile and in Argentina, I thought this food is happening. It is, it, and, and, and the world is ready for it now. Yes. So your new book should be absolutely wonderful. Oh, good for you, Sandra. Thank now, you. do you feel more pressure that it's can, that it's two books, one in Spanish and one in English, or do you just feel that that gives you an advantage to get more exposure? A little bit of both. It feels like a lot of pressure because it's a big book in terms yeah. of size. It's it's you know it's it's going to be a, a lot of recipes. It's it's a big terroir to to explore. Really, the territory of Latin America is huge. Yeah. But also is very exciting because there are not a lot of cookbooks translated into Spanish. And there are so many people who speak Spanish around the world, yes. um, you know, that I think it's going to be exciting to see how it's received. So, you know, that, that to me is, is I'm very hopeful that it's going to be well received because oh. it's written in a new way. It's a different way of writing. Okay. And did you come up with a different way of writing? Yes. 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 And, and that's based on the research and all the history of cookbooks that I've done. I've studied cookbooks in Spanish that go way back to the 1400s, you know, and you go by and you see how recipes have changed over the eras, recipe writing. And then, of course, you bring it to the United States and then see how the books here have also uh, changed throughout the eras and how directions change and um, so I'm very excited about that. You know, that's so interesting. You know, Diane Jacobs. 
Absolutely. She, I, I love her. I love she's her. a personal friend, but she's also one of the most extraordinary experts. On yeah. food writing. The cookbook coach. Yes. I have worked with Diane. Diane has done some editing on some, uh, 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 a book that I don't know if it's ever going to see the light of day, but if it does, it, and you know, but in her newsletter, if people don't know, Diane has a new newsletter that's a paid subscription for, but if people are listening to this wonder, trying to glean some information about publishing and ideas and stuff, Diane goes into length talking about cookbooks. But one of the things she said was she was still talking about language. And of course, she also wrote the book, you know, about food writing, which has been in our fourth edition, which is so successful. But you know, in all that, and as I ramble a little longer, so, you know, in all that, recipes have changed. So she had said to me, and I don't think she liked it, and then I, I haven't talked to her since, but, you know, in the olden days, the Judith Jones, I mean, oh, if you put a word, they, if you used a word that they didn't like, they came down on you like a sledgehammer. Do you know what I mean in recipes? Yeah. Just, I mean, it would come down on you. Don't say, of course, I remember, and Cindy and I wrote a lot of recipes for websites, but for big corporate clients. Well, what we learned from that was we would say, take a fry pan, take a saute pan, take a saucepan, a two quart. Now we said that because if we didn't, Sandra, as people stopped cooking, as we know in our society, we would get emails that said things like, well, you know, I used the pie pan that I had. It was too much liquid to go in there. Or when we wrote, we used to just write, we always wrote two whole eggs. Yeah. And we, they, they said, stop, no, everybody knows it's two eggs. Two whole eggs cracked, we used to write. And we stopped, they said, no, no, you don't need to say that. We got an email that said, well, the chocolate cake was delicious except for the egg shells in it. Oh, it was gritty. Oh, no. Oh, yes. So when we monitored a lot of websites, we saw that people didn't cook anymore. And that that recipe, even if you were a little redundant with a word or, you know, you mentioned something in the instructions, we felt that people needed it. So, you know, you see recipes have changed. And I think that it's supposed, they're supposed to. Absolutely. But the language is very important, Denise. It's because cooks before, like our grandmothers and their mothers, they know the basics of cooking already. So all they needed was very little direction as to what to do. I, you know, I, I've seen many recipes in Spanish that say, um, cook the chicken until it's done. Sure. You know, well, how do you know that the chicken is done? Right. How do you know to do that? Now, is that overdone? <laughs> exactly. Is when that it's like shoe leather, it's too done. Is that, do you cook it until it's so dry, like my grandmother's turkey that it slipped <laughs> in the throat? My mother was a wonderful cook, a wonderful cook. And my dad was a good cook. I ever, all the men in my family cooked. But we ha I had a grandmother that couldn't really, she couldn't make toast. It was a joke. I didn't, and she would always say, let me make you some toast. Oh, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> what, when she would say, I'll cook the turkey, your mother does so much work. My father would be in the background saying, no, 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 no. Because he used to say, he'd look at all of us and he'd say, that turkey was so dry, I thought it was going to slit my throat. Oh. So your point, your point is well made. No, honey. And when people don't know how to cook, I'm sure when I first got to culinary school, Sandra, that's what the French chef said to us. We'd say, we were asking all the questions. Or they would yell, go get the rondo, go get the, the, well, I didn't even know what they were talking about. And I'd say, well, what does that pan look like? Well, just go find it, you know? And they would all do the same thing, cook until it's done. Well, how do you know what's done if you've never cooked it before? Exactly, and I think there is a generation, the lost generation of cooks that after Julia, you know, Julia Child, right? Julia, who doesn't even need her surname for everybody to know who she was. But after her books, her books were so detailed, so um, detailed. pages and pages of instructions. And she, that's how she taught American women how to cook French food, because she, <laughs> she could, she could put all those words in there and, and really give descriptions. That's what new cooks today need, because they haven't learned to cook. And there's, I always, you know, because I've been writing about food, to regular cooks, that's, I don't, you yes. know, to the regular Mr. and Mrs. America cook. The home cook. Exactly. All these years, 
And I get a lot of questions asked. I say, there are two things that people, that offend people when you're writing a cookbook. One of them is when you talk down to them. But the other one is when you assume that they know things they don't, because then that offends them again on the other side. That's right. And so the language for writing books needs to be very friendly, very empathetic, but also very clear uh, so that people can follow a recipe. Uh, it's sad to me that cooking, which is a creative outlet, you know, like painting and like um, music is something we need to do every day in order to eat. We have to cook. The majority of people, unless you have gazillion dollars and, and cooks that make it for you, you have to cook in order to eat every day. Well, and people are pressed with time, you know, and they want to cook in 30 minutes and they have very little ingredients. The pandemic don't even mention it. We couldn't find ingredients. So people find themselves with all this pressure and having to produce a meal in, you know, before an hour. Well, if somebody asked me to do a sculpture out of clay in an hour, I'd kill myself. <laughs> I wouldn't know where to start. That's right. I'd eat the clay, you know? I just wouldn't know what to do. So we're asking people to do the same thing. We need to give them clear directions so they can succeed. That's exactly right. I feel for Sandra, you know, it's always interesting because I've been in food so long. Cindy and I would do recipe tests during the day, but also I went to the market or had one of the girls go to the market for me, but I always plan what I'm eating for dinner. Do you know what I mean? We barely have had our tea and coffee, but I'll say to Kenny now, especially when I'm home and I've retired from styling, I'll say to him, we're having burgers tonight. We're having chicken breasts tonight. We're having you know lamb chops with some asparagus. So he always knows because if I don't plan, it's too hard. You cannot wait till your children are screaming at 5.30 in the afternoon to figure out what you're gonna feed them. Do you know what I mean? I as a mother, you learn that as a babysitter, as a, you know, a mother's helper. So planning is everything. And that's why with cookbooks, you know, and like what you said to Julia, old books like Joy of Cooking, the original one stuff, I had that as a new cook, Sandra, because if I didn't know how to um, bake a baked potato, I could look it up. No, if you've never cooked a baked potato, why, how would you know that you can turn it as high as 400 degrees? You know what I mean? If you've never cooked a baked potato, maybe you don't know that you have to poke it with a fork or a knife so it doesn't blow up. Do you know what I mean? I mean, and people today say, well, we have the internet, but how many recipes in the internet are actually tested? So many people, you know, I've taught cooking now for over 30 years also. So in my classes, people will come to me and say, I don't know how to cook. And I say, oh, you know what? You do know how to cook. Everybody can cook. If you can read, you can cook. The problem is, what are you reading? Is the recipe that you're using tested? And I think a lot of books have ruined people's desire to cook because the recipes are not tested. And, and so it's important that people know that when they go to the internet for a lot of these recipes, they may look great on paper. And the cook who did it actually did a great job but she did not know exactly how to write the recipe down or the recipe wasn't properly tested. There's so many steps that go into helping somebody produce a recipe successfully. Absolutely. And honey, I've got, I, we have written recipes for chefs, for celebrities. They go all the way through. Do you know what I mean? There's an editor after an editor and a marketing thing. And then the book comes out and there's still mistakes. Okay. One of the biggest books we ever worked on was the first book we ever worked on was Suzanne Summers. It sold a million copies in a month because she was on HSN in those days, Sandra. And, but you know what, all the way through, and we hadn't written it that way. It got typeset that salt was slat. So in ever in a hundred recipes in that book, it said one teaspoon slat, one teaspoon pepper, whatever. Now, and I had just started working with her. I didn't know how funny she was. She was very kind. And she was on a TV show. We were on a big TV show. And she and the host pointed out and said, oh, my God, does that say salt, slat instead of salt in your cookbook? She said, yeah, it was a mistypo. And he started to say something. She goes, it could have been worse. It could have been slut. Exactly. <laughs> and I, That's funny. That's funny. But. Do you know how many people had had their hands on that book at Crown and Random House and no, and it still got printed wrong? 
Yeah, you it's know? a meticulous job and the author has got to be on top of everything too. It, yeah. it, it's very interesting, the world of cookbook writing. It's very, very interesting. It's not at all what people think of. I See, I think people think all of food, Sandra, and this gets into it. And I think people think, because it's all romantic, like restaurants. I know exactly kind of the flowers I'm gonna put in my restaurant when they open and I'm thinking, honey, don't worry about the flowers. It's the grease trap. That's right. <laughs> the grease trap that you got to figure out or, you know, or when the walk-in goes down. So I think this is all romantic. Food is romanticized, Sandra. And also people, I've had this, and I'm sure you have. I've had people then that call me and said, oh, big bloggers, as an example, as you talked about. But they'll say, oh, it's my first cookbook. And I have so many eyes, you know, they have, like, I don't know, a hundred thousand people go to their blog every month and then they'll say to me but they only offered me fifty thousand dollars as an advance and i'll say that's a very good advance that's very good advance and they'll that's say what are you talking about i said oh honey you hear about the one the one blogger that gets you know and I, the hundred hundred thousand dollars and that's wonderful god bless them anybody that can get that god bless them in my thing or you hear about the author when Jada De Laurentiis was at the top of her game with her TV show that was airing like every other day. I, you know, I was one of the people that worked for me was on her team for a while. And she did get like $750,000 advance. And you know what, again, she earned it. She was yeah. on like two TV shows and she had a famous last name and she, you know, learned her trade and she did just fine. But most people, I don't think, Sandra, understand that women in food, that you may only get $100 or $150 for a recipe test. And that's where we're speaking to your point, which is why some books get published and the recipes haven't been tested. But if someone only gets ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 advance, if they don't have resources, how can they test all those recipes and, you know, I always say absolutely, people, absolutely. And people don't, that's one of the things people don't take into account. That's it's right. not just your time writing the book. It's all the ingredients you have to get. It's how many times you have to test a recipe to make it perfect. You know, um, writing, rewriting, editing, copy editing, all the, the other steps that go. And of course, we want people to still think of cookbooks as romantic. That's, yes. if we don't, produce a for sale <laughs> exactly we don't produce a cookbook that seems romantic to the people we won't sell it but uh but there's a lot of it one of the things that impressed me so much when um when i heard you speak at one of the conferences many conferences we've been i think this was Le dames over in um california oh, yes the newport beach yes the newport it was was a wonderful the conference, conference. Yeah. yeah and you spoke to us about how to ask for more money and how how women need to be brave enough to to ask and that was so helpful people don't talk about that at least to us women we don't hear that message you know we had the money manager on a week or two ago and one of the things and i love seeing younger women i mean oh, i'm so old sandra when i was growing up though my father there were no boys just three girls my father was always saying, you girls, you, you go to college if you want to, or you do what you want to, but you need to make a good living. He was, all, my mother, on the other hand, was saying, oh, marry well, marry well, marry well. Well, okay, different voices. But I know this, in my generation at 70 years old, nobody ever talked to me about money. Do you know what I mean? Until I got in the workforce. Eve, 20s and 30s, you took a job or you knew this, maybe your career wasn't set yet. But when all of a sudden at 28, I went to work in my father's real estate brokerage mm -hmm. and everybody said, and I used to test and the counselor would say, she's not very good at math. Well, when I found out that it was 6% of whatever the house sold for was my commission, I was excellent at math. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I, okay. So then when I got out of that and I went to cooking school, the first thing I remember was everybody just saying, oh, well, chefs only make this much money. There were only a few celebrity chefs then, Wolfgang Puck and, you know, Julia, of course. But we also know Julia didn't make money at first. For years in her career, she didn't make money. But Julia was from a very wealthy family and she, Paul did all right. Pam, Paul's family had a little money too. So she wasn't starving. 
But I, when I started going to ICP and getting into food, I kept thinking, we don't ask for more money. Yes. That's why women aren't making more money. And it was, and I said this to you earlier, but it bears repeating. When I married my second husband, Kenny, who I married to now, he turned to me after a short period of time and said, food is too loosey goosey. Why don't you girls have better contracts? I don't understand why you food writers aren't getting paid the same money that someone who's writing a mystery novel gets. And I remember thinking, it was like a, a light went off in my head. So that's why, Sandra, though I think that food is so creative and it's an art form, I decided that I had to treat it as a business. Otherwise it's too hard to not make money. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And it's the way that you say that about your husband, because when I started writing and I decided that I was gonna write, Louise said to me, okay, this is not a hobby, this yeah. is a career. So that means I'm not subsidizing absolutely anything you do. You have to pay for everything yourself. This is how you keep a book. And this is, how, of course, he's a finance guy, right? Yes. It's Good best, for him. Yeah, it's the best thing. It sounded rash at first, but the next day I said to myself, yeah, that means I'm going to be independent with my money and everything. It's the best advice he's given me. And the best advice he gave his daughters, our, our girls. Uh, and look at them. They have su successful careers. When this was one year, and this is all I'll say about money, and thank you for saying that. That was a great conference. It was a wonderful panel, and it was supposed to be about money. But, you know, again, my generation and two women that were on the panel with me, we talked about it later. We talked about money used to be, oh, don't talk about money. I remember my aunt saying to me, oh, don't bring up money, or you can't talk about money. People was all this big secret. Well, secrets breed contempt and they breed, you know what I mean? If people, I mean, I, I, I look at someone who's made a lot of money at food and they're inspiring to me. Do you know what I mean? I, that if they've kept their integrity and they're doing what they want and they're making a lot of money, why not? You know I mean? yeah. How wonderful that Louise said that to you. I have a group of friends. They're my big chill girlfriends, we call it from the movie, The Big Chill. We all went to, we went to grade school, seventh and eighth grade together, high school. We were bridesmaids in our first marriages. Oh, how beautiful. Oh yeah, so much fun. There's six of us. Three of us had children. Three of us never had children. But we get together at least once a year, always for lunch. But sometimes we get to go away for the weekend. And in our mid fifties, so I've been running my business now for 15, 16 years. And I, I don't think I'd remarried yet. So I was really independent, financially independent. And I bought a house and I, you know, I went on vacations and I paid my employees. So I was doing okay. But I said to all of them, do you girls have life insurance from your husbands? And they said, huh? And the ones that still had babies, because they of course were in jobs like they were married to attorneys or married to doctors, but their job may have been a school teacher. Do you know what I mean? Which is so incredible, but they weren't nearly making that kind of the money of their husbands. And I didn't mean to be a downer. And I wasn't, I just said, girls, I just went to this financial class and they were talking about life insurance because if your husband dies, you probably can't even stay in the house that you're in because you won't be able to afford it because they make so much more money than you do. Exactly. Talk about a downer at a party. Now they got real quiet. And about a week later, I got a phone call from three of them and they said, I'm getting life insurance my husband. I'm taking out life insurance on my husband. And I said, I'm so proud of you because the ones, and one of them said, and when I asked him to take out life insurance, he said, ah, oh, you'll be fine. And she said, it pissed me off. Now they've been married like for 45 years. <laughs> they've obviously worked things out. But you know what? We should, how wonderful that your girls got that. My two nieces are the same way, Sandra. They, and they, both of them own their own businesses. Do you know what I mean? So I think that, but cookbooks, writing cookbooks, doing recipe development, being a food stylist, um, working for a magazine, I don't care what you do. You have to be worth, you have to know your worth and you have to ask for it. Exactly. And I think that one of the mistakes that new writers make now, particularly because of the internet, is that they write for free. I know. I say content has a lot of value content is money and honey they don't undercut, and they undercut the market 
I get a lot of phone calls. So now that's the new author and they signed the cookbook deal and they got a $20,000 advance. Of course, they hadn't read the contract correctly. I always say to everyone that people email me Sandra, and I just say, I know you don't think you want to, but go and pay a $200 an hour attorney to read the contract, spend an hour in his office, check off in the contract with a pencil that you understand. Because of course they didn't read the fine print. And then they say to me, I'm responsible for the artwork. Yeah. And I don't know how to tell them <laughs> that the artwork could cost their entire advance. So there's so many parts, moving parts, as you've said. Now, of course, the first time or two, you make a mistake, okay? But after that, my mistake on my very first book, Sandra, and this is funny, but it was, Kenny read the contract. I signed it. I got the smallest advance in the history of mankind for my first book on catering, which is still in print, has had eight editions, oh. and I just got a check a, a month or two ago for two grand from it. So I don't know who's still buying it, but I got a royalty check. It's still in royalties. Now, so I've made the money on that book, and I love that little book, and it helped me with so many things. But I signed the contract, and at the bottom of it, I said to Kenny, what's all this stuff about ASCII disks and all this stuff? He says, that means you're going to learn to use a computer. Because, honey, it was like in 1990, 91. I'd been a chef. I didn't know anything about computers. That's so, so funny. Oh, yeah. I, honey, I was the executive chef. I had an assistant in the kitchen that programmed all my invoices and everything into the computer. Do you see what I'm saying? I had never touched a computer in my life. That's the same thing that happened to me when I started working at the paper and they hired me and they said, of course, you need to bring a word document every Monday. And I hung up the phone and I told my, my husband, boy, what a weird editor. Of course, I need, I'm going to bring a document full of words. And he said, oh, gosh, I've got a weekend to teach you how to use a computer. Same uh, thing. Makes me so happy to know it. Well, and then I learned the computer. Of course, do you know how many times I'd written a couple of pages? And remember in those days, Sandra, I didn't know how to save it. Yeah. So oh, yeah. like, I weren't automatically saved. So I would write two or three pages, think I was doing so I'll come back and it was gone. <laughs> oh, oh, I think we all learned the hard way with those. Yeah, on top of it, we I think the learning curve for those in our generations, and I'm I'm a little bit younger than you, but not you much. are younger, you're much younger. <laughs> no, but um the learning curve is steep, and you need to be able to. Uh, be brave enough to go and find out the information on your own, you know, and, and, and ask people. Again, it's all about asking, right? Mm -hmm. Asking for help. Um, but not being afraid and not saying, oh, I don't know how to do it, so I won't take the job. No, just say, yes, I can do it, and then go find out how to do it. And you know what? I've lived by that my whole life. I've gotten so many jobs I was never qualified for. And my fate and, and did fine. By the way, I didn't fuck it up anymore. Than <laughs> but one of my favorites, Cindy had only worked with, well, she'd been working with, she and I had been working together for a while. But one day I said, you this great job. It was good money. Blah, blah, blah. I said, you're going to go by yourself. And she turned to me and she said, do I know how to do that? I said, of course you know how to do that. <laughs> You'll be absolutely fine when you get there. Now, I remember thinking of the old expression about you to teach the baby to swim, you just throw it in the pool. And then I remember always thinking that's really not a very good idea. But guess what? She did so well. And you just have, you know, we don't always, I said that I say this all the time. I don't think we see ourselves very honestly. I think we see our flaws. Most of us see our flaws, yes. not our positive things. And one of the ways I learned that, and I've tried to be better to myself, to my friends, to my sisters, by pointing this out is that I have stood on in the wings of a television studio with people that were talentless, horrendous, nasty. And guess what? They were successful. But do you know why? Because they believed in themselves. That's right. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great point. It's incredible how we set the bar so low for ourselves yes. at times because, again, of this fear that we have of failure, yeah. right? Instead of saying, well, yes, I'll do it, and then figuring out how to get it done and, and meeting a new bar that's higher. That's right. And that's how you get, I think that's how you succeed. I remember interviewing Emerald the first time 
This was my very first celebrity interview in the newspaper before the internet. That's how old we, we, we are, you know? And I went to, my, to the editor and I said, I just landed an interview with Emeril Lagasse. Uh, do you know how to tape a conversation for an interview? And she said, I have no idea. I had to run to the store. I don't remember the name of the store anymore, but it was one of those gadgety stores. Yeah. And the guy there selling me the, the tape recorder told me, you have to ask a question. Can you be recorded? Then you have to go through all these things in North Carolina, the law is this. And I managed to do it. And after that, I was recording all my conversations with everybody else, you know. But if I had been too scared to do Emerald's interview, I would have never broken through with that aspect of my career. Because after his interview, I was getting all of these people sent to me by publicists from all over the world. Because, of course, Emerald was huge. Huge. And yeah. your network grew. And yeah. so that's the part you need your network your platform, your network, and how fabulous. Well, Sandra, I think honestly, if you and I were charged, we could, people should ask us everything because we have the answers to life. But if it's not this time, soon, let's hold out for that. I cannot thank you enough. I'm excited for your re-release of your book, which I know that book because I cooked from it and it was fabulous. Thank and you. honey, as always, it was just my pleasure to talk to you and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. I send you a big hug. Okay. Now, if people want to know more about Sandra, you can Google her. And what will come up, one of the first things that comes up, it's only a year old, is a PBS interview on a, a PBS station, your local, I would assume. And I don't have, and he was darling, but he was so, you were so much, he runs the show, but Sandra was so much better. I wanted to say, oh, buddy. I hope you're watching her and taking a lesson. And there's several things that when I Googled you, and there was a wonderful Huffington Post article on you. So if people want to talk about, people want to know more about you, they could read those things before they buy one of your books. Honey, thank you so much. If people want to reach Cindy and I, you it's at womenbeyond at icloud.com you send us notes we find that a lot of people like to private message us i don't know why they don't say anything that they that other people shouldn't read but we seem to have people that want to private message us a lot which is fun and cindy as always thank you for everything you do and sandra thank you honey i'm so glad to see you it was like I, almost as good as sitting next to you Oh, thank you. And I hope we do get to sit next to each other with a great meal again. Me too. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.